This is Asia News Weekly, the podcast featuring news commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific region. China's pot is calling the Philippines' kettle black, plus Seoul risks alienating others. These stories and more are coming up on the May 8th edition of Asia News Weekly. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Asia News Weekly Podcast. I, of course, am your host, Steve Miller, and it's so great to be here with you. So thank you so much for joining me. Now, there is no war yet in the South China Sea. But as I have said on a number of occasions, I do believe that is the world's flashpoint area. Now, this past week, China has upped its rhetoric against the Philippines, saying that the Philippines is violating that 2002 Code of Conduct. In a statement just before midnight on Monday, China's foreign ministry urged the Philippines to stop its malicious hyping and provocation on the dispute, whose basis, it said, was Manila's illegal occupation of certain Chinese islands. Quote, The Philippine side has conducted large-scale construction of military and civil facilities, including airports, ports, and barracks on those islands for many years. End quote. And that's coming directly from the ministry. Now, the China and the Philippines are still at it once more. China even went so far as to say to call on the Philippines to halt all action, to halt all work, and to evacuate its people from the area. Wow. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black. China is doing exactly the same thing on a number of islands in the South China Sea. If you look at the scale, what China is doing is on a far larger extent. And in my opinion, both sides are possibly in violation of that 2002 Code of Conduct. That 2002 Code of Conduct says that when there is a dispute, both sides need to essentially step away, respect one another's claims, and go through a process to resolve it. During this discussion, there should be no building, no improvement on land masses. And I think both are failing on that. You have China reclaiming land, and you have the Philippines building on reefs as well. And if you look at things even on a closer basis, it does appear as if China has unilaterally thrown out that code of conduct because it's unwilling to discuss the matter on a multilateral basis. It only wants to deal one-on-one with other ASEAN members, Philippines, Brunei, Vietnam, etc., where it can actually bully these countries into submission. They are not interested in actually discussing the claims. They say that that 90% of the South China Sea is inherently theirs. So we get to this point where we are now, where it's really becoming a futile situation. China is establishing these bases, these reclaimed land masses that have ports, that have airships. We have that one that looks to support, when it's completed anyway, a 3,000 meter landing strip. It's digging in for the long haul. And quite frankly, no one is stopping them. We do have drills in the area, Philippines and the United States conducting drills in the South China Sea. On occasions, Japan will step in and patrol the area as well. It has pledged support not only to the Philippines, but to other nations as well. But that's not enough. We could see a situation like the Cuban Missile Crisis, manifest in this part of the world. Because that appears to be, possibly, the only way to halt China's progress into this area. Possibly some kind of blockade that would stop ships from supplying these islands. We saw a brink of war in the 1960s. And if we continue down this path in the South China Sea, where China continues to move in, two things 
are bound to happen. Two alternatives, shall I say. One, China is going to take over that 90% of the South China Sea because no one is willing to step up and stop them. Or number two, we're going to have a situation where one side is going to stand up to the other and force the other one to back down. And right now, it's that first situation that we're seeing. China is rolling into the area unchecked. And unless the United States, unless Japan, unless Asia members start working together to put in a blockade, to put in some kind of process that will actually stop China, like I've said before, they've already won. They have already claimed that area. And unless you stop them, they're going to hold on to it forever. Truthfully, South Korea has a lot going for it. A very strong economy, even though there's some debate whether or not that is actually the case. Powerful technology, busy ports. But the one thing that is working against it is a sense of self-importance. As a very small nation, it feels, South Korea, that it is on equal footing with larger and more powerful nations. And to be perfectly honest... It isn't. Last year, Japan announced plans to list industrial facilities as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Tokyo's Cultural Affairs Agency recently said the International Council on Monuments and Sites, or ICOMOS, has recommended the registration of 23 sites of Japan's Meiji Industrial Revolution built in the late 19th to early 20th centuries. They were cited with contributing to Japan's rapid industrialization and adaption of Western technology to its needs. And that's absolutely true. However, Seoul objects to this being listed as UNESCO World Heritage Sites because many of the workers at these facilities were South Koreans. And now Seoul is facing battles on many different fronts. First, well, rarely does a site after it's been recommended by ICOMOS, the ICOMOS, not get listed as a World Heritage Site after ICOMOS does that recommendation. Secondly, while South Koreans were actually forced to work there, the facilities, like I said, are historic. They have an important basis for Japan's current status as a world economic and productivity power. Third, the international community is able to separate the emotional issues of World War II from historic ones. And that is something that South Korea really has been unable to do. Even calls this past week for Seoul's foreign minister to resign if UNESCO lists these sites as World Heritage Sites, which has absolutely nothing to do with foreign policy. But it is an emotional reaction by South Koreans on this issue. But something even more, I would say, knee-jerk is taking place in Seoul between Seoul and Tokyo. South Korea has once more announced the latest round of the Dokdo defense drills. Now these, of course, are the small islets between South Korea and Japan that both claim. In Korea, we call that Dokdo. In Japan, it's known as Takashima. Now, according to Yonhap News, the planned exercises will involve some five to six destroyers and convoys, as well as some fighters and patrol planes. The drill will include a landing training exercise by a squad of Marines as well. Now, to the government's credit, this defense drill is not defending are training to defend against Japan, but by other groups who may try to sail from Japan and land on Dokdo, which of course Japan calls Takashima, to call, cause international trouble. But the fact that this drill is even taking place shows a certain level of parano paranoia over some rocks that no one in the world cares about. It also plays off an irrational anti-Japanese fear and behavior in South Korea that believes that Tokyo is on a militant track to take over the world once more, when it quite frankly isn't. To outsiders, not only those within 
the Korean Peninsula, but around the world, hearing the rhetoric from Seoul time and time again is off-putting in some circles. And quite frankly, what it risks doing is making the historical arguments that Seoul legitimately makes, legitimately makes against Tokyo seem less important. The rest of the world has gotten over World War II, is able to separate what the right-wing revisionists are doing in Japan for rewriting history and ignoring historical facts versus the nation itself and the majority of people in Japan. South Koreans, many South Koreans, the Seoul government, is unable to make that leap. Whatever Abe says, whatever right-wingers say in Japan is then broadcast as the official statement of Japan and the official tone of Japan. And they aren't able to separate an emotional issue from that, from the factual issues. And if South Korea continues to make historical arguments based on emotions and essentially cry wolf over issues where Japan is concerned, it's going to find its statue stature and its place in the world, well, reduced. And it's going to find itself with allies and other nations paying more attention to Japan than South Korea. Even now, the United States realizes that as a partner in this portion of the region, Japan is more important and it's paying more attention. So as much as the United States doesn't like the tone that Abe takes with regards to history, Abe is able to placate the United States by saying enough to satisfy the leadership in the United States. And that's what South Korea risks increasing throughout the region. So let me be perfectly clear. So there's no mistake anywhere. Everyone around the world needs to take Japan to task on historical issues, but do it from a sound historical argument point of view. Don't do it on an emotional level. Follow what all these historians around the world are doing and citing evidence and drafting well thought out and well crafted le letters to criticize certain points of view. Don't make it an emotional plea because the more that soul does that, the less likely it'll have the support of the international community. All right, let's take a quick look at some other stories from the region. Now, first up, tomorrow in Moscow, the Kremlin is hosting a World War II celebration marking the Allied victory over Germany. Not on hand for this event will be North Korea's Kim Jong-un. However, Kim Jong-nam, the president of the Presidium of the Supreme People's Assembly, will be there. Now, there is a lot of speculation as to why Mr. Kim is not attending this event. Some say, well, they're speculating that it is an unnecessary security risk for Kim Jong-un. And others are saying that it was Russia's lack of enthusiasm for the DPRK's plan to purchase air defense missiles. Now, whatever the reason, the thing to watch about this event is who exactly Kim Jong-nam cozies up to while he's there. Because as we have seen in the past, the DPRK is attempting to strengthen its ties with Russia. Also on the DPRK front, with nothing coming from their attempts to deal with Pyongyang on abductee issues, Japan is now taking their fight to the United Nations to try and force more information out of Pyongyang on the abductees. From the beginning, I've always said that Kim was just going to pull a bait and switch and was just trying to get something for nothing from Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and that's exactly what he got. Nothing. So, Japan is going to push for more international cooperation on sanctions against the DPRK. Given North Korea's long history of sanctions and China's role on the Security Council, well, I just don't see too much coming from this. Sanctions also haven't proved, well, too effective in stopping North Korea from continuing down whatever path it truly wants to follow. So the world, as I've said many times, needs to find a better carrot to try and get North Korea to behave, quote unquote, like a rational actor. 
If you do recall, earlier this year, January 25th, there was a massive firefight in Mindanao, the southern region of the Philippines. Unfortunately, 44 special special action force police officers were killed, and it created a huge political headache for President Aquino. Now, the goal of that specific raid on January 25th was to take out two Islamic extremists, some terrorist heads. Now, one was killed in the raid, and just this past weekend, the second was raid was killed. Rather, now will this do a lot to mend the lingering feelings that some have over this botched raid? Well, that does remain to be seen. Now, and finally, Eric Chu, the party leader for Taiwan's ruling KMT party, met with President Xi Jinping in Beijing. Chu said during the meeting that he hoped to see Taiwan and China bolster collaboration on improving environmental converse, uh, conservation, regional security, and economic development as the Asia-Pacific based on the foundation established in the 1992 consensus. Now, the 1992 consensus was the foundation for the whole One China, Two Systems policy regarding Taiwan. And Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party is concerned that as the KMT continues to form tight bonds with Beijing, with mainland China, well, they're fearing that statements like Chu's could lead to a diminished role of Taiwan, especially where it regards its sovereignty. Chu actually said at this meeting that both sides of the Taiwanese Strait belong to one China. And they're worried that as the KMT continues to negotiate trade and other deals with Beijing, it may lessen their political weight in these negotiations. And remember, last year around this time, we had the Sunflower Movement, where students walked into the legislature of Yuan and really halted things. We could see something like that again in Taiwan if the KMT continues to push forward with its objectives over the calls for review by the Democratic Progressive Party and others in Taiwan. Well, my friends, the podcast is winding down. I did say this would be an abbreviated podcast as I have been traveling throughout South Korea looking for my next job. But before I go, I do want to thank those who are contributing to the podcast via Patreon. These are John, Mark Etene, Brad, Daniel, Brayhawk Technology, Eric, Robert, Tim, Christopher, R. Wiseman, Hiko Simon, and Victor. Thank you so much. I, I really can't say enough for the trust you have in me and putting your hard-earned money into Asia News Weekly. Again, it's just a small $2 contribution through Patreon. You can find more information at patreon.com slash Asian News Weekly. $2 a month, less than $0.07 cents a day to help me with all the expenses and putting together and hosting the podcast. Now, before I go, I do want to take a look at some of your comments. So let's get started with that. Now, first up, Adobo777. This Korean-Japanese headbutting needs to stop. It's pointless and counterproductive to their geopolitical needs when both could benefit from each other if they can just get over World War II. Imagine how the Chinese would behave in light of a solid Korean-Japanese-American defense pact. Imagine how strong a political pact between these countries could help the other smaller Asian countries, like the Philippines and Vietnam. Imagine the stability that could bring. Absolutely, like I said earlier in this week's podcast. Red White Dude responded, While Korea's public relations needs to improve on why this issue needs to be settled with an apology. The United States Congress passed an act to compensate Japanese Americans for their internment in World War II, yet you don't see anybody dismiss as old news, which some people tend to say. If anything, the United States needs to hold Japan accountable as well, because this right-wing view negates all of the World War II post-war settlement. Comfort women and such are just the tip of the iceberg. This would be a slap in the face of World War II veterans. This is something that if Koreans were smart about, would realize, would capitalize on to convince everybody, especially in the United States, instead of just emotional outbursts and protests. If you just gloss over this because of urgency to deal with China, then it could have serious repercussions in the future. Absolutely. 
Eye of the Shy Dragon said, "I'm glad that the United States told China no, that we aren't going to use the islands when the weather is good. China is just a big bully and trying to take all the small islands from them、uh, for for themselves, not allowing other countries to either fish or get near them." And finally, Darth. <clears throat> And finally, Darth J F says China is winning the South China Sea. Once they have built all those facilities on reclaimed land in the little islands, there'll be no way to get them out. Well, my friends, again, thank you so much for taking the time to leave your comments on the various podcasts this week, whether it be on YouTube, on Facebook, or via Twitter. And I hope you'll take a moment to share your thoughts once more. I'm not quite sure what the podcast schedule will hold for next week, but I do promise. To keep you up to date with more information from the region. And to keep up with more news from the region, please follow Asia News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. You can also send an email to the show with your questions, your comments, and more importantly, your feedback. That email address is podcast at asianewsweekly.net. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. It's absolutely free and easy to do. You can do it on our website, AsianNewsWeekly.net, or inside your favorite podcast application like iTunes or Stitcher. Well, that is all the time I have for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, my name is Steve Miller, reminding you to be true to yourself and to always be awesome. <laughs>